Hello everyone and welcome back to Learn Hittite and look where I am today, the Tarim Basin in Western China. Why am I here? Well, today we're diving into the fascinating world of Tukarian, a language closely related to Hittite. It's documented from the 5th to the 13th century AD and was predominantly spoken here in and around the Tarim Basin in Western China. The Tarim Basin, known for its challenging climate marked by low rainfall and extreme variations in temperature, held a unique position as a crossroads between East and West, offering the Tukarians some distinctive opportunities. Tukarian speakers were able to levy taxes on caravans passing through the region, facilitating trade between East and West. Combined with their mastery of irrigation farming and their unwavering dedication to Buddhism, we can actually catch a glimpse into a devout society that really tried to make the most of their environment. The Tukarian language remained hidden until the late 19th century when a series of European and Japanese expeditions to the region unearthed it. The corpus of Tukarian has since expanded, comprising a diverse array of texts, including religious scriptures, primarily Buddhist, but with actually a surprising Manichaean addition, administrative financial records, and remarkably, a really cheesy love poem. It's worth noting, however, that the term Tukarian is actually a little bit controversial. The Tukarians refer to themselves as the Arshi, and sometimes the Kushenne. However, for the sake of convenience, we'll stick with the term Tukarian. So kick back, relax, and let's delve into the world of Tukarian language. Okay, so you might be wondering to yourself, where exactly is the Tarim Basin? Well, we're here in northwestern China. Let me draw the outline of the basin for you. Like so. As we can see, it is 80-90% surrounded by mountains, and it is mostly arid desert. However, through the northern half of the basin runs the Tarim River, which acts as the main source of water. Now, of course, we have our Proto-Indo-European heartland here on the Pontic Caspian Steppe. And that, of course, raises the question, how and when did the Proto-Tukarians migrate from the Proto-Indo-European heartland on the Pontic Caspian Steppe to the Tarim Basin? Well, there are currently two theories, and they're both kind of related. The first theory is supported by academics such as Mayer, Mallory and Peyro, and it states the process was something as follows. So we have the Pai homeland at around 4,500 years BCE. And the theory then suggests that there was a northeastern migration to somewhere around here. And that the Proto-Tukarians became associated with what is known as the Afansievo culture. And this was around 3000 years BCE. Of course, all the dates here are approximate. Then there was a southern migration into the basin. And this occurred no later than 500 years AD, because that's when we start to have the first Tukarian texts. Now, the second theory suggests that the Proto-Tukarians were not associated with the Afansievo culture and that they in fact migrated towards the basin as a result of the expansion of the Indo-Iranic speaking peoples. Now I'm going to present some evidence that suggests that it was the Afansievo route responsible for the migration of the Tukarians into the Tarim Basin. And I also believe that there is some genetic evidence that supports this also. But as with many things connected with Proto-Indo-European migrations, languages, cultures, genetics, there is a lot of debate. So let's outline the main differences between Proto-Indo-European and early Tukarian. I want to stress though that there are many more nuances than what I'm going to present here. However, for the sake of brevity, we're just going to discuss the differences which are the most striking and the most relevant to what we're going to talk about today. However, I will provide some links in the video description where you can go and read about the differences between Proto-Indo-European and the development of early Tukarian in greater detail. 
So our first difference between early Tocharian and Proto-Indo-European is that early Tocharian lost its laryngeals. Now, obviously, laryngeals were important in the reconstruction of Proto-Indo-European. If you're unfamiliar with laryngeal theory, please go and check out my video on it. Uh, but basically, Proto-Indo-European is believed to have had three laryngeal sounds, which are represented as such. The exact articulation of these three sounds is currently debated. However, they were uh, produced towards the back of the mouth, towards the larynx, and they had an effect on the sounds of vowels around them. And basically, early Tocharian lost all of them. They transformed either into an A or they disappeared altogether. Secondly, early Tocharian experienced a loss of voiced and aspirated consonants. A voiced consonant is a speech sound produced by the vibration of your vocal cords. So if you think of the sounds B, D and G in English. And an aspirated consonant is a speech sound where there is a burst of air following the articulation of the consonant. So if you think of like the initial P in PAT, there is aspiration on this consonant. Summarizing in Tocharian, it looks something like this. K, G, and breathy G condensed simply into K in Tocharian, and T, D, and breathy D condensed into merely T. This change must have been quite dramatic because actually if you look at many Proto-Indo-European reconstructed forms, they often contain one of these sounds. And for early Tocharian to have reduced this system so dramatically, it would have been quite a dramatic shift. We can see this change in action if we take the Proto-Indo-European dehag, meaning to darken. Ultimately, it's where English gets the word dark from. In Tocharian, it became Takir, meaning cloud, and we can see this change from the breathy D to the T sound. Also, we have the Proto-Indo-European reconstructed form Gem, meaning to grasp, became in early Tocharian either Kamate or Kamat, meaning something like to gather, and we can see that change here from the G to the K. These are just some examples. Um, I haven't fully listed the complete paradigm. Again, I will provide links in the uh, description where you can go and read up on this some more. But basically, if you go and look at uh, early Tocharian Swadesh lists, you see a lot of Ks where we would expect other consonants based on the Proto-Indo-European form. Thirdly, we have vowel reconfiguration. If we look at the vowel systems in Proto-Indo-European and early Tocharian, on the surface, they look comparable. But actually, when we dig deeper, we find out that early Tocharian underwent radical changes in how the vowel system is configured. Primarily, we find Proto-Indo-European O becoming either E or A in early Tocharian, and the vowels in early Tocharian lacked any length distinctions. And finally, we have the secondary case system. So early Tocharian had an equally developed case system as we find in Proto-Indo-European, but actually many of those cases have been completely reformatted. From Proto-Indo-European in early Tocharian, strictly speaking, we only have the nominative, genitive, accusative, and elements of the vocative. All the remaining cases are completely refashioned, function differently, and are actually formed by the use of a secondary case added to the case ending of the accusative. Tocharian also lacked a dative, or rather the function of the dative merged with the genitive. So if you needed to express a dative idea in early Tocharian, you would actually use the genitive to do so. Now, what does all of this mean in practice? Well, let's take a look at one paradigm. Here we have the Tocharian word nakte or nkat. Now, the reason why we have two forms here will become clear in just one moment. But basically, we're going to focus on this form right here, nakte. This is the nominative form. And we can see that we have uh, the acoustic form here, which is exactly the same. 
The genitive form, na tense. So we would use this if we wanted to express a genitive idea or a dative idea. And here we can see where the secondary case endings come into play. Because for the allative, the ablative and the locative, we take the accusative form, nakte, and we add the secondary endings to the accusative form. So here we have the main differences described between Proto-Indo-European and early Tocharian. But what can all of this tell us about the journey that early Tocharian took to get from the Proto-Indo-European heartland to the Tarim Basin? Of these four changes, three innovations are attributed by Michael Peyrot, an academic from Leiden University, in his 2019 paper, where he argued extensively that these specific changes were a result of language contact between proto tocharian and the languages from the Uralic language family, specifically proto samoyedic and possibly from the Yenisean language family. All of this points to a contact point north of the Tarim Basin, precisely where the Afansieva culture was located. However, there are several drawbacks to Peyros' theory, notably that our knowledge of the history of the Uralic and Yeniseian speakers in the historical record is definitely lacking, and also the robustness of Proto-Uralic and Proto-Yeniseian reconstruction isn't as comparable as it is to Proto-Indo-European. There are other gaps in Peyro's argument. For example, whilst appearing to be similar on paper, the noun cases that we find in proto tocharian aren't actually functionally comparable to the noun cases that we find in Uralic or Yeniseian. In fact, Tocharian has one additional case which is lacking in both Uralic and Yeniseian, and it doesn't appear to be reconstructable in proto forms. Furthermore, whilst many of the changes to proto tocharian are significant, they're not necessarily unique, and we do find similar changes in other proto-languages descending from proto-Indo-European. So the exact migration route of the Tocharian speakers from the proto-Indo-European heartland to the Tarim Basin is still an open question. However, evidence does point towards the Afansieva culture being the most likely intermediary. However, further genetic, archaeological and linguistic research is needed. Tocharian is actually attested in two forms, Tocharian A, or East Tocharian, and Tocharian B, or West Tocharian. There is some evidence for a Tocharian C, but this is only attested in a few loan words in other languages. Any conclusive evidence is missing. Tocharian A appears to have been restricted to use in religious or ritual contexts. Tocharian B, however, is much more general in use. It's used in both secular and religious contexts. Tocharian B is much better attested than Tocharian A. It's also more conservative and we can actually trace different stages of its development. Since the early 1960s, linguists have been engaged in discourse regarding the potential presence of loanwords in Tocharian from Proto-Turkic, Early Mongolian and Old Chinese. It's equally noteworthy that Old Chinese, in turn, reveals its own intriguing connections by featuring certain Tocharian loanwords within very specific domains. It's important to note that the early history of these languages is still unclear, and it's possible that some of these loans moved by intermediary languages. Anyway, let's take a look. So here we have some examples of loan words from Proto-Turkic and Proto-Mongolian into Tocharian. So we can see, for example, that the Proto-Turkic word am, meaning to be quiet and gentle, was borrowed into Tocharian B as arm, meaning silence. Arm doesn't have a reliable Proto-Indo-European reconstruction, so this loan from Proto-Turkic seems quite plausible. In Tocharian A, we have Tamam. In Tocharian B, Tumane, meaning 10,000. From the Proto-Turkic, Turmen, meaning very many or 10,000. 
Kenek and Kanak, meaning cloth, from the Proto-Mongolian Kejeng, meaning the edge of cloth. One thing that you'll notice when you go through the lists of potential loans from Proto-Turkic and Proto-Mongolian is that the genre of the loans seems to be all over the place. Some loans connected to feelings, everyday items, parts of the body, specific parts of the body, things like that. However, when we take a look at the next language, the domains become rather specific. So let's have a look at Old Chinese. Now, all of the loans are only attested in Takarian B, and that's probably because of the nature of Takarian B being more generalized than the Buddhist specific Takarian A. And what we can see here is that all of the loans, and this isn't all of them, there's many more. I'll provide links obviously in the video description where you can go and read about linguistic arguments behind these loans, but you can see that all of the loans are connected with trade, right? Because it's important to have words to describe dry weight, units of money, wet weight, measure of volume, abacus, obviously for counting. And here we have the old Chinese words, which are supposedly the sources of these Takarian B words. So we have chak for dry weight, chana for unit of money, shank for measure of volume, and shipankich for abacus. Now, it wouldn't be a Learn Hittite video without an example sentence in Takarian for us to analyze and break down. This is in Takarian B. And it's the same sentence that we looked at in the Proto-Indo-European video and that I've looked at previously in my Hittite specific video. We have English translation, father gives wool to mother. In Takarian B, Pacher, Yakwa, Matri, Aisham. Now we have the um, word for father in the nominative singular. Yakwa is in the accusative plural, although I've seen very similar sentences where they use the singular form yok. I would imagine that the singular form and the plural form could both be used uh, to refer to wool. Obviously, yok would simply be a singular collective noun. Matri, again, it's in the genitive singular because Takarian lost the dative, but it's expressing a dative relationship. And we have Aisham from the Takarian verb I, meaning to give, conjugated in third person singular. So we haven't gone into too much detail around Takarian culture, kingdoms, or their oasis strongholds. It's way beyond the scope of this video, but intriguing, isn't it? How Takarian, once a vibrant language of the Tarim Basin, faded into history. The disappearance of Takarian, ultimately, is a tale against time, shifting cultures, and changing circumstances. As we finish up our exploration of this fascinating language, it's essential to understand that Takarian gradually succumbed to several factors. The influences of neighboring cultures, the ascent of neighboring Turkic and Chinese languages, the decline of the Silk Road trade routes, and possibly even climate change. As we know that during the sixth and seventh centuries, there were some particularly dry periods. While all of this played part in pushing Takarian to the brink of obscurity. Ultimately, in political terms, the Tarim Basin became a focal point of competing interests between Turkic and Chinese kingdoms, until the Uyghur Khaganate took control of the area in the 9th century. From then on, Takarian slowly died out as the population slowly but surely switched to the old Uyghur language. Yet, the legacy of Takarian lives on, reminding us of the diverse linguistic tapestry that once flourished along the ancient Silk Road. I do hope you've enjoyed this journey into the past and the history of Takarian language. 
and uh, I hope it motivates you to continue that exploration. Thank you for joining me today. It was an honour and a pleasure to be able to spend some moments talking about Takarian language with you. Any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments and I'll be sure to get back to you. And until next time, goodbye.